so Dr. Mason, the person that you came here to hear, uh, he's, most of you know, he's the COO of Cook County Hospital, and uh, a wonderful speaker, very dynamic, very interesting, and, uh, and very motivating. So, Dr. Mason. Well, first of all, let's thank Kay. And so, uh, so all of you get a chance to look at it, you look at it outside as you walk in, you just kind of walk past it. You kind of walk past it, okay? But well, I want you to walk past it again. But I, not right now, but most of what I, I, I'm not saying anything new that I haven't said before, but there are some new people. Uh, how many of you have been to one or more of the classes at Trinity? Okay, good. So that's a good mix. I know. Flo, I see Fred over here. Fred's with Fred, and, and oh, well, there she is. Both, I didn't see you walk in. When did you walk in? While you were... While I was with you. So Ray and, and Susan, uh, they've been coming in. Of course, they have a big event coming up. Uh, when is that, Ray? It's the uh, August the 12th and 13th. August 12th and 13th. And it'll be where? It's the St. Vincent University. It's, um, uh, it's the Veggie Fest. Uh, and, uh, it's the uh, forty thousand people. Yeah, about 40,000 people show up to their event. Mm. And it's uh, two days? It's a two day event. Two days. I've been fortunate to be there. I have some of the past. Okay, I've been there to the Veggie Fest probably every year as a speaker in the main tent. And it's a great event. So, not only that, there's a lot of food, there's a lot of people, there's entertainment, there's all kinds of stuff. So, let me first of all thank you all for coming. I really I want you to know I appreciate it very, very much. And I want to thank Kay and and Bottom. Bottom is also doing a, an event. He used to do an event. I don't know if you're still doing it. Uh, so. we'll, we'll skip this year. We'll skip this year. Uh, it's Veggie Pride Parade. Veggie we do Pride one of the events every month. We do like at least two events. One in suburbs, one in Chicago. So, yeah. in, in fact, today at 12 o'clock, I'm going to Mandras Beach to help clean the beach. That's <laughs> <laughs> a different story. <laughs> okay. So, I've, and I've also been privileged to, to be a part of Bottom's event which is it's right there on Columbus Drive. Right? Yeah. right there on Columbus Drive, and then there's a walk that happens afterwards. So I think over time, there's been a lot more momentum for this. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I did want to go over a, a couple of things and real quick for the benefit of those of you who have not had an opportunity to, to see <coughs> or hear what, we, what, we, what we've been talking about. So with that said, I'm going to... This is... Don't worry about these titles. This is... I recycle. I'm very efficient, so I recycle things a lot because it's important. Because what I found when it comes to this topic, talking to doctors is no different than talking to the lay people because they know about the same. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when I'm talking to doctors, this was what a talk I gave at the at the Southern Illinois University School of Medicine uh, for physicians, and uh, it's really talking about the 21st century health system. And so. But it's a lot of good stuff in it because the first thing I do is always acknowledge Imhotep. Imhotep is the real father of medicine. Many of you may have heard or been told that it was Hippocrates, but Imhotep lived over 2,400 years before Hippocrates was even born. And he was a physician that treated over 200 diseases he did. Not only did he do medicine, but he did dentistry, he treated tuberculosis, he treated, he did, uh, and it also, the other part, the reason why I like to bring up Imhotep is because, unfortunately, the Eurocentric way of looking at medicine splits it all up. But when you go back and look at some of the original uh, pieces, like Imhotep, Imhotep was considered a priest. He was a priest, he was an astrologist, he was a physician, and that's because we could see the mind-body-spirit connection. And that's what's missing, one of the major pieces that's missing in medicine. You cannot talk about trying to heal the body without focusing on the mind. And you can't help about doing, help have any evidence that you're going to do that well without focusing on the spirit. Because we tend to leave those things out because it's not part of the culture that we've been accustomed to. But I can tell you as a physician that practiced for nearly 27 years in the city of Chicago, um, patients did not mind you praying with them. Yeah. Patients did not mind you acknowledging whatever their faith, their faith system was, even if they didn't have one. So it was, it's really important because it is how you connect to people that can create healing. You might fix a problem, but you will never heal it if you don't make that connection. So, and this man here 
is, is the man who actually, is, Sir William Osler, who was one of the founders of the Johns Hopkins University, uh, Johns Hopkins University, who actually resurrected, uh, helped to resurrect Imhotep. So this is a, a person that I wanted people to know. I put this slide up only because whenever we talk about black people in particular, it's always we got more disease, we always got worse outcomes, we always are in such bad shape. But I put this, this, this comes from actually a paper, but a book, look at, it's called Western Diseases, and when we look at how, when we go back and look at Uganda, when some of the English people came to Uganda and they started doing some things, I won't say what they were doing, but uh, they were doing some things. And what they did was they tried to understand what was going on. And when they started looking at autopsies, that is, people who had died in Uganda, what they found was when they looked at, and these were autopsies, so this is where they actually took it out, took at the tissue to make sure. And when they looked at these 632 cases of people who had died between the so-called whites that were living there, and I hate to use that term because it's really, it, it really, it's a, it's a horrible term to describe people by color. That, that makes absolutely no sense if you think about it. But anyway, when they looked at these 632 people and looked at 632 uh, Ugandans, they only found evidence of one small heart attack. Just one. And so they said, oh no, that maybe there was a problem. So they did some more. So they did some, some more. They did 1,400. And they still could only find one heart attack. One. And it was a small, healed heart attack. Which meant it really didn't cause any problem. The other thing that they noticed is they didn't find prostate cancer. They didn't find any evidence of appendicitis. They didn't find evidence of most, most of the cancers. Most of the people still had all their teeth. The, the dentition was good. So the question is, how did people who were like this, and actually I'm doing a talk in about three weeks in Boston to a group of uh, urologists talking about diet and prostate cancer. I hate doing those kind of talks because I hate people thinking that there's certain diets for certain organs. That's stupid. <laughs> You either eat good for everything or you eat bad for everything. That's the way it is. You don't have a diet for a prostate and a diet for a colon and a diet for the heart. No. It's the same thing that works for everything. And I'm going to show you that. But what they found here was that, what was, the reason I bring this up is because we always hear about all the negative things about African Americans. And it's, it's like you're genetically, we're genetically cursed. But the truth of the matter is, there's nothing wrong with us. It's something much more wrong with what we eat and where we and how we live. That's what the problem is. It has nothing to do with the genetics. And even though people might try to make it seem like there's some genetic uh, uh, connection, that's not true. It's just not true. And they do that because they're trying to. Now we're looking at this whole area of what's called personalized medicine or this. Uh, targeted sort of thing, and that's because these companies that have these genetic mm -hmm. testing things want to spend all this, have you spent all this money to have all this stuff done, and the truth of the matter is that if there's something wrong with your genes, the medicine's not going to fix it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> if there's truly something wrong with your genes, there's nothing wrong with your genes, there's something wrong with your hand. <laughs> okay? That's what the problem is. So, you know, I, my story, many of you have heard me talk about it. But my story has been one where I, I, I went to medical school at the University of Illinois. Um, by the way, I just have to say this while I'm thinking about it. I just got notices that I'll be given the Alumni of the Year, University of Illinois College of Medicine Alumni of the Year Award this year. All right, all right. In November, I'll be celebrating at the University of Illinois. And I'm going to say the same thing there. So, you know, because you can't be afraid of the truth. Right. You should never be afraid to tell the truth, no matter what the consequences are. So if they never invite me back, so what? <laughs> anyway, the, the thing is, is that what I have to say in terms of my own journey, I was trained at the University of Illinois, good school, went to practice, was, uh, had residency training at what was called Michael Reese, some of y'all remember, some of you don't. Uh, and then I practiced urology on the south side of the city for about 27 years. 
one of the things I was doing was I was treating men who had erection, erection problems. And as we learned about what was causing the, what was really the cause of the problem, we learned, I began to understand that, wait a minute, we're treating the wrong disease. We're not treating the right disease. Giving guys Viagra, and I gave a lot of Viagra, I did a lot of, and for the guys I did a lot of penile injections. I had about 400 guys that were injecting their penises with these drugs every time they got ready to have an event. Uh, and if they, and obviously some of them had needed more assistance than others because if you look down and can't see it because of this, that creates another problem. And that's probably the major reason why you're having a problem in the first place. Okay? So, the other, the other thing was that once I understood that and began to understand that diabetes, ED, so-called heart disease, so-called stroke, all those diseases all tend to run together. And I'm like, well, you know, and, I, and my, my training was those are all different diseases, but they're not. They're not. I'm going to show that to you in just a minute. So these are the things I think that we should be doing if we want to try and improve things. we got more technology now. We have the ability now in less than a second. I mean, I could have Facebook live this whole meeting to the world. That didn't exist several years ago. But now we can. But the thing is that I wanted to focus on this thing about reducing harm, improving health, and treating the cause of disease. That, to me, is where the, where the problem is if we're going to do something for this 21st century health system. Because right now, we don't have a health system at all. We have what I call a disease detection and management system. And we spend $3 trillion. And if we look at the trajectory of so-called health in America, it's not really getting better. It's really not getting better. So we can't buy our way. We can't spend our way. And to think that we're going to operate our way out of this is absolute insanity. I've been, I've, I watch this series from time to time called My 600 Pound Life. I don't know if any of you have seen that. It's on television now, but it chronicles these people that... One young, the last one I saw, the young man weighed over a thousand pounds. Mm. How do you eat yourself to a thousand pounds? There was nothing wrong with his gland. There was nothing wrong with his head. <laughs> and the people that kept feeding him. And stuff. So let me just say that if I go back, you go back, and and I have these thoughts about how we can do this. And this guy, Dr. Macari at, at Johns Hopkins, came up with this thing. Do you know? that medical errors, here's heart disease, cancer, and medical errors. Medical errors are the third, going to hospitals and being treated in our medical system is the third leading cause of death in America. Third leading cause of death. Right behind heart, cancer, then medical errors. So when we were talking to the docs, I said, this is where you got to work right here. You've got to work on, you young docs, you've got to fix this. Why are we killing so many people in our health care system? Yes, ma'am? Doctors won't wash their hands. I, I wash that on nutritional facts, too. Yeah, well, <laughs> not just that. Well, that was similar wise, but it's more than washing hands. We've done a lot. We've done a lot, but we haven't done enough. I mean, just wrong site surgery or wrong person surgery mm -hmm. or medication errors yes, right. yeah. or complications of medications mm -hmm. or complications of procedures. I mean, you now hear on TV because they have what's called fair balance in advertising. And that fair balance is this. No problem, no problem, guys. When you got to do it, you got to go do it. No, that's not uh, you, What you hear is fair balance is you hear them talk about drugs for depression on TV. And they said if you take this drug for depression, it may cause sleepwalking, it may cause suicide, it may, all those things it talks about, that's called fair balance. That's to make sure that you understand that the, there's complications or consequences to the medication you take. Every single medicine. And that's because all of our medicines are designed to, to stop one particular little pathway. One set of chemical reactions. But those set of chemical reactions aren't just for that. They do a lot of other things throughout the rest of the body. And we spend a lot of money, and there's a lot of money to be made in pharmaceuticals. So that's what's important. That's what's important. So the, the next thought I asked was, well, are we really treating the real disease? Maybe we're having a big problem because we're not treating the right thing. So when I looked at this, 
we looked at all of these things, and I asked people, you know, I asked the docs, what was the number one cause of death? You know what they all said, right? What they say? Heart disease. Heart, so called. So, and I'm going to say this now. I'm going to start putting it in front of all of these things. So called heart disease. So called heart disease. So then I asked him this question Is it? Is that really the cause of the death? No. No, so of course not. So this is what we say. Well, I, I say to the folks that a heart attack is a misleading term. And it's a misleading term because early on, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the heart. Nothing's wrong with the heart. Okay? So you say, well... It's a problem in the blood vessels that feed the heart. That would be correct. There's a problem in the blood vessels that feed the heart. But how did the problem start in the blood vessels? Where did that come from? Okay, so it came from the stuff that was in the blood. Because it's the blood that brings everything to every organ in the body. The blood does that. So whatever we do, all of what we eat, somehow, and the whole, pro the whole purpose of this 30 feet or so of digestive system that starts with the, in our mouth, 10 inches down through our esophagus and through our stomach, 24 feet through the small bowel, and six, around 6 or 7 feet through the colon, the whole purpose of the digestive system is to take this brain and you start chewing it in your mouth. And there's certain enzymes in your mouth that start breaking down the starches, breaking down the sugars in your mouth. And also, you got to get it broken up into small pieces, which is why you have we have these molars that help grind this stuff for us, because that's what it's for. Then when you swallow this thing that, that's supposed to be like a paste, down into, through your esophagus, into your stomach, your stomach is nothing, this is one tube from here to here. It's all one tube. It's not separate things. It's all one thing. And it's designed in different parts to do different things. And I actually have movies that can show you that. It's a nice little movie that goes through it. But the point I want to make is when it goes into the stomach, the purpose of the stomach, it's, it's this, the same part of that tube, but it's blown out. It's far more muscular. And then there's a lot of acid in there. And the acid in there is to begin to start breaking everything, all the energy, all the nutrients in what we eat is locked in, in long chains of these, what do you call them, proteins or series of amino acids or series of carbohydrates, what you call sugars, and you got to break those things up. And so that's what this stuff begins to do. So after it, it mixes and churns it around in the stomach, which is why it's important to chew. Because if you don't chew, then your stomach can't do what it's supposed to do. All right, so when you chew and it comes out the stomach, it goes into the small bowel. Those are y'all's chitlins. It goes into your small bowel. <laughs> well, I mean, if you open a person up, they got this. All the animals are the same. All the animals are the same. I don't want you to think that they're different. They're not. If you take a human and put them up like this, and you put a chicken and put them up like this, and you take a cow and put them up like this, it's all the same. It may be bigger, smaller, shorter, or longer, but it's all the same. So when you, when you eat your chicken wing, and I use this all the time, when you eat your chicken wing, this is the wing of the chicken, the chicken's arm. So when you bite into that chicken wing where there's that one bone, that's biting into the chicken's biceps or triceps. That's what you're eating. Because meat is just muscle. That's all it is. It's muscle. And it depends on what muscle. That's all it is. I don't care whether it's beef, lamb, pork. Doesn't matter. Just muscle. You're eating a muscle. Even fish. Why do you think a fish can swim like that? Because its muscles are oriented to, along its axis so that when it contracts, it pulls it this way. And when the other side contracts, it pulls it that way. That's how the fish swims. So when you eat the fish, you have the skeleton. The fish runs down the middle. And you got all the meat or the muscle on the side. That's what you're eating. So when you bite into the chicken's bicep, there's two, one bone here. And then there's another part of the chicken wing where you have two bones, just like you have here. Same thing with the chicken leg. One bone down here. Two bones in the leg. It's all the same. So understand that you're, so when you leave here, you know that you're eating, you're eating the muscle. And there is where the, where the problem comes from. Because when you break the muscle down, it breaks down the different chemicals that we're going to talk about how this, what this does. 
So, but the problem, going back to the blood vessels, yeah, they're blocking, I'll show you that in a minute, but it's not the blood vessels' fault. It's what's in the blood that creates the problem. And how did it get in the blood? It got in there from the way we ate. It's the product of our digestive system. It's the product of our body. Because in order for the body to use the, the nutrients and energy from the foods that we eat, it has to break it all the way down. Does that make sense, y'all? Yes. yes. It has to break it all. If you can't break it down, you can't use it. I don't care what they say. You got to understand, you've been totally duped by all this crap on television. The whole purpose of television is the programming on television is there to make you watch the commercial, not the program. The program is just to get you to sit there until the next commercial break. That's the purpose of the TV commercial. Okay, and the reason why you pay so much on Super Bowl Sunday is because there's a lot of people with their butts in the seat watching the game and they're going to watch the halftime show. And even though, like at the last Super Bowl, it was, but it was, who was the sponsor of Super Bowl 15? A halftime show. Pepsi. Pepsi. See? I bet you if I waited long enough, everybody would remember. That was, she came floating and rolling around and all that stuff. But it was Pepsi. And that's because they have to leave these images in your mind. And these images are what drives you when you go to the grocery store. And even you have little voices that speak to you when you walk through the store <laughs> that, that ask you, no, I'm serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it is. That's yeah. the purpose of advertising. Yeah. And they go after your children with all these bright colors and cartoon characters and prizes <coughs> and stuff like that. And they put that on lower shelves so that when you walk through the grocery <coughs> store, your little kids, I want, you know, they don't know what's in there. All they know is that it's sweet and it's the same little cartoon character they saw. So, and then it gets in their blood, and we start our children off on a course to be sick for the rest of their life. That's what we do. And it got in the blood, it got in there from the food. So if that's true, see the problem is y'all never ask these questions. You never ask these questions, you stop right up here. Oh, they say it's in the blood vessels. Well, if you look at all of these diseases, cancer, high blood pressure, stroke, they all got the same risk factors. Yeah. Why do they all have the same risk factors? Because they're the same disease. Okay. It's not different. It's all the same. And I can show you, and many of you have seen these, but if you look at as we well <coughs> in America from 1994 to 2010, we got more diabetes. Yeah. This, you see those maps, they look the same, don't they? But what they want you to think is that your diabetes is different than your this, is different for that, so you can take a pill for your eye diabetes, you take another pill for your high blood pressure, you take another pill for this, and another pill for that. That's what they want you to believe, but it's not true. So, if you look at high blood pressure, this is the map of the United States, right? And if you've seen this earlier, this is the southern part, southeastern part of the United States, right? Yeah. All right, so if we look at high blood pressure, where you got a lot of high blood pressure, this is death rates from heart disease. This is death rates from stroke. Yeah. This is death rates from cancer. Yeah. Look where it's all clustered. Mm. Yeah, In the same places. Yeah. Why? Because it's the same problem. <coughs> it's the same thing that's causing each and every one of these things. That's why it's that way. Not to mention that we eat way too much. We've got this idea we got to eat all this stuff. We don't have to eat all this stuff. All this stuff. We eat almost, and as I show you all the time, this is actually, we have actually now we're up to almost over 100 pounds more meat than we used to eat. But just between 1950, some of you all were born in 1950, like me, I'm actually 51. Uh, but we used to eat 16 pounds of chicken in 50, and now we eat almost 53 pounds of chicken per person, per year. And all you got to do is go, go right out this door, look down Stony Island, and see how many chicken places there are. Yeah. Even the burger joints got in the chicken bin. Yeah. You can get chicken at Wendy's, you can get chicken at McDonald's, you can get chicken at Burger King, you can get chicken everywhere. Go so down that way, one of the few churches' chickens is still down there on 71st Street. So that, that's what the problem is. And the same thing is, you know, we triple the amount of turkey that we're eating. We're drinking less milk, but we're eating more cheese. How do you think that happened? 
How do you think we ended up eating more cheese? What do you see advertised now on TV? Cheese. In what form? Pizza. Yeah, well, no, what's the big form you see? Football games. Pizza. 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 I never saw so much pizza being consumed. We didn't even have any of that when I was growing up. But we eat so much, and the pizza, and the reason the cheese is a there's a movie coming out talking about cheese, and one of the things you need to know about cheese is that milk, which is cheese, is just spoiled, clabbered, curdled milk. That's what it is. So they take the acid from the cow's stomach and they put that in the rennet, and they make that that acid to curdle the help curdle the cheese, and then they take the cheese. They have that's why you have cheese cloth because that helps to separate the curds from the whey, okay? And you now have a, these curdled, these cheese curds that you now can put together. You can do other things to them to create, and then you dry them out by using lots of salt. So that's why there's fat and lots of salt in the cheese. But even more importantly, in the cheese is milk, and in the milk it's called, we have, there's casein and there's casomorphs. Casomorphs, which are like morphine-like compounds. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And that's why you get, you gotta have your cheese. <laughs> Just like you gotta have your sugar. Sugar is probably one of the most addictive substances that we eat. It activates the same part of the brain as cocaine. And that's why sugar's in everything. And now you can't even get your kids away from eating sugar. Everything they got has got sugar. And the cereals are full of sugar. Their sodas are full of sugar. Even the adults are in on the sugar thing. You go to these, it used to be you used to get coffee. I don't even know what it is that people drink today because I can't pronounce most of the frappuccino, capo, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Latte, frate, rate, you know. But we also are drinking a whole lot more milk. And we drink a lot more milk because we believe we've been brainwashed to think we need the milk. The only milk that I'm going to push and that as that, that I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about is breast milk. Because it's African Americans have the lowest breastfeeding rate <coughs> in the country. And there's no reason to hook your child up to a cow tit. <laughs> which is what you do when you give them milk. But when you unless you have a problem teat, I should say. Unless you have a problem developing milk for your child yourself. And when that child grows to the point where they do not need breast milk from the mother anymore, they don't need milk at all. At all. Period. It is the American dairy industry that promote, promulgates this idea that you need milk from the cows from the strong moms, but that's not true. That's not true. Mm. Got milk. Got milk. Yeah, well, I mean, but, but, and they get a lot of subsidies for a lot of this stuff. And there's a lot of things in the milk, the bovine somatotropin. Right now, we're actually pushing back the bill. That actually just a recent case of someone who just died from drinking raw milk. But we, I'm actually going down to Springfield a little bit to testify again against raw milk because a lot of people want to drink raw cow milk. Um, and, and I should tell you that there is an allowance by the public health department of how many pus cells can be in the milk and it not be prohibited from safe. Because you gotta remember now, a lot of these cows, the only way that a cow gets has milk is the cow has to think it's pregnant. So they artificially inseminate the cow. The cow then has a calf. Okay? And when the calf is born, they take the calf and guess what that's called? Veal. Yeah. That's the baby cow that they kill and then serve to you as veal. Yes, ma'am. So would you say the cow's milk is good for calves? I would say it is only good for calves. <laughs> it is the it is the perfect yeah. genetically made food for baby cows. Right. Only. You don't see dogs going to, to suckle on pigs. You don't see giraffes going to suckle on rhinoceroses. You don't, you don't see that anywhere in the animal kingdom except with humans. And that's because they made an industry, a multi-billion dollar industry, out of the whole. So anyway. You were saying about pus. 
<laughs> and that's where you, how you got on. I mean, the pus is because they're perennially pregnant and being milked. But yeah, all these machines, the, these suckers that they put on cause an inflammation in the udder or the teeth that's attached to the udder. Because, you know, normally when, when you, you remember the, the way the baby cow gets milk out of the teeth is the same way the baby gets milk out of the woman's breast. Okay. And that's by this sucking motion, right? And it sort of massages and pulls it out. And these casomorphs they are in the even in breast milk, but it's believed that that's helped with the baby to latch. Mm -hmm. They actually make them like a mini addict to have them latch to the mom, in a way, way of speaking. So anyway, but like I said, you've all of you seen these pictures. This is a week's worth of food in India. You can see it's primarily vegetables. This is a week's worth of food in China. There's some meat, but more grains, more vegetables here. This is a week's worth of food in Germany. Much more processed foods. Yeah. You see the other two. And this is a week's worth of food in America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is from a movie, a book called The Hungry Planet, What the yeah. World Eats. So I have the whole slide set. It's hundreds of pictures of stuff, but I think it's very telling. Because most of what you see here is not even real. It's all a manufactured product. It's not real food. And so when you eat this stuff, when you eat this stuff, your body is like, what the devil is that? <laughs> It does not know what to do with it. It can't process it because there's nothing. If it comes out of a, these aren't even real potatoes in the potato chip. It's a potato chip product. It is some mushed up thing that they mix up. You don't have potato chips when they're natural. They're all stacked one on the other. Or all fit nicely together. That's not how potato. Potato. Have you ever had a real potato? And some of our children may not ever see a real potato and make real potato chips. But this is. This is one of the things that you have to look at. This is, this is what the problem is. This is what's creating the inflammation or the irritation of putting these chemicals in the blood that the body's inside lining of the blood vessel is reacting to, causing a blockage that causes the heart attack, that causes the stroke, that causes the peripheral vascular disease, that causes, and even eggs. Eggs are, eggs are, I'm doing this talk on prostate cancer and a number of things, but Absolute for any man, for any person, eggs are off. These are chicken embryos. Right. Yeah. These would be baby chickens if they were allowed to go the natural course. There's no reason we should be eating chicken embryos. You just happen to eat them, and that's part of the Americana. That's a part of our socialized way of eating. Uh, eating. But this is this is what's killing America. This is what is causing us to spend three trillion dollars. There's not anything up here on this thing. Even the processed meat. You don't know where that meat came from. You don't know how long it's, you don't know the animal it came from. When you're buying a bag of wings, you don't know how many, you know how many chickens eat? Chicken only got how many wings? Two. So if you got a bag of 40, that's 20 different chickens. And you don't know what happened to the rest of the chicken. And you don't know what that other part of the chicken looked like. You don't even know if the other part of the chicken was diseased. You don't know what, you don't know anything. But what do you do? You batter it, you fry it, and you eat it. And you talk about how good it is. And I know, I used to say the same thing when I didn't know any better. Same thing with this stuff right here. This is full of these, these artificial creamers. And even this stuff over here, and these, these grapes, which are probably seedless, so anytime you eat a seedless anything, that's that's a genetically modified. Uh, I want GMO. Stop eating seedless grapes. You get grapes with seasoning. Get watermelons with seasoning. Get all your fruit with seasoning. Okay? Because you can't. And all this stuff here, these this is a chemical solution. It's full of acids, sugar, colorings. You call it soda, but it's actually a chemical solution. It is manufactured. And I can show you how much of what you see here is a derivative of corn. It's manipulated corn. That's what it is. It's processed and manipulated corn. And they want you to, and they, they have all these things to tell you that this stuff is, is good and you should eat it, but it's not true. And I, I, I implore everyone in this book, young in this room, young or old, don't take anything I said true, go look it up yourself. Go read it yourself. You know, there's no reason for anybody to be ignorant because now everything you can imagine is on YouTube 
everything you can imagine is available for you to read. You can learn. You can learn how to play a piano on the TV. On the okay. So, so this is the disease. So this problem here, they tell us about all that stuff I just showed you. This stuff, that's what causes this blockage. Excuse me. And yes. One, one second. I just want to make this point. So what do we do? You get a blockage. And here's another another take home message. Symptoms are stupid. There's not one disease that causes a symptom in its earliest, most reversible state. Not one. So this whole notion that our, our, our the medical community is giving you to talk about symptoms is the absolute wrong way to think about a disease. So when you have a symptom, they talk about what are the symptoms of a heart attack, so-called heart attack? Chest pain, what else? What? Tightness. Tightness, what else? Shortness of breast. Pain in the left arm, radiating down, right? That is not an early symptom. You're having a heart attack. <laughs> That's late. That's not early. What about stroke? What is it? They go out fast, right? FASD, what does F, F stand for? Face drooping. Face drooping. All right, so if your face is drooping, why is it drooping? That's because the nerves that supply the muscles, I mean, the nerves that supply the muscles, that keep those muscles in tone is damaged or is being damaged. Slurred speech. Can't lift and hold your arms up. Okay? Or you can only hold up one arm. That's not early. That's late. Okay? When you have that, and this process right here is creating a problem, what we do is we take these metal things right here. These things, it looks like that. We put up a wire through your groin, or sometimes through the arm, and we put a wire, snake it all the way up to your heart. Then we put over this wire, this, this, uh, this uh, a balloon. We then inflate the balloon, and we just take the plaque and just splash it, squish it upside uh, against the walls of the arm. That's what we do. I have one of them. I know. I got one in 2005. I remember it. That's why I know. Actually, I begged the guy when I was on the table not to do it. But I was, he says, no, you've had this drug and that drug, and I'm not. So I'm like, okay, what am I doing? I can't get up and walk off. So anyway, so they put the balloon in, they smash the stuff up against your wall of the artery. Then they put this stent there. So what did we just do? We just smash the stuff up and put some wire there to try and hold the, the damaged part of the artery open. But guess what happened? Like Bill Clinton did. You end up going back eating the same crap and you end up blocking the stents again too. Yeah. This is not an answer to the problem because it doesn't fix the problem. Now, let me say that if any of you have chest pain or strokes or anything like that, you should. this is what you need at that point in time. You should get it, go get it, and go to a, try and get to a good hospital. You need to go to a, my, my nephew was, is 40 years old. He wasn't feeling well, lived at 127th Street, got on the train because he wanted to go to the University of Chicago. He didn't want to go to the hospitals out by him. Smart, but not a good thing to do by himself. Got on the train, got down to near the University of Chicago, barely made it into the University of Chicago, got in the emergency room and evolved his whole stroke. He had a stroke that 40 years old, knocked out his, off his vision and all the function on this right, left side. But fortunately for him, it happened in the hospital where they could do something about it. And it evolved right in front of the doctors. So they whisked him up to the, the, the lab, and they were able to do the angio, get the clot, pull it down, uh, administer the clot busting drugs. Three days later, he walked out the hospital. He was just fortunate and blessed. Wow. But if he had ended up at some of the other hospitals out there, he might have never regained his sight, and would never have gained the function of his left side. So I'm just saying that those things, while they're great, and that you need those services for that reason, but if you're going to go back and eat the same stuff and do the same thing again, what different? What did you just do? And that's why we end up with more blockages afterwards. And it's the same process. Here's the same little block. All these things are, they're named by the, by the artery that's blocked. And whatever that part of the artery serves, whatever part of the brain, 
Whatever, that's what dies, and that's what you get. But it's the same problem. It's not different. Whether it's up in your neck, same problem. Down in your leg, same problem. Same problem. There's no difference. So you do not, if you've had a heart attack, you have much, much so-called risk because you've got the same problem going on in your brain. And it's a matter, just a matter of time before you probably will end up having to think about having a stroke. If you had a stroke, you're at risk for a heart attack. If you had one of those, you also got, you got the, the blood carries the body everywhere in the body. And every blood vessel in the body is damaged. You don't get one part of it damaged. It's all damaged. And so to think that the medications, while they're important, they give you drugs, like tell you to take aspirin or to different blood thinners and things of that nature, which are important. But it does, not un it does not deal with the underlying cause of the problem. And I'm going to skip through some of this because we have young people in the audience. I'll skip through this. So what I want to do, my last thought, how do we treat the cause of disease? And I'm going to submit to you as I bear the close that the number one cause of disease in America is food. Yeah. Is what? Food. Yeah. Number one cause of disease. Food. Not genetics. Genetics only are responsible for maybe 5%. Maybe 5%. Even breast cancer. And when we used to talk about African Americans, be they men with prostate cancer or women with breast cancer, and why? It's because the dietary pattern is passed down from generation to generation. You eat the same thing your grandmama ate, the same thing, she, and the difference though, the difference was that what your grandmama ate, like when I used to go south, that food, that chicken had been running around in the yard, free range chicken. The vegetables were all picked out of the garden, organically grown. Okay, and not only that, but my aunt at 80 years old could walk across the field faster than I could. Exercise. And they also want to make you believe that exercising is... The, the call, I mean, what we, and exercising is important, but I'm going to tell you in terms of weight loss and, and control of disease, weight, uh, exercise is only 15 to 20 percent of the solution. 80 to 85 percent of the solution is food. And the only liquid you need to drink is water. And I'm not going to get all bent out of shape about alkaline water. There's water. Bad water is better than great pop. Right. <laughs> So that's, that's the, tr the true cause. And this is how we treat it. This is the real pharmacy. This is where you get all the things that you need. You don't need to try to try. Why would you go to try to buy somebody who's got all this stuff in the pill? I'm going to tell you, I am not pro-supplement, except for those of us who are vegan who need B12. So you need to get the B12. But other than that, and you can get that orally as an under-the-tongue thing, or if you want an injection, you can get it that way. But other than that, to go to these... Those are those, those stores that have the doses of that stuff that you see in those stores is so much higher than the body can even assimilate it if it can get it out of the form of the pill that it's complex right. with. <clears throat> so all that stuff is not going to help. You can take all those supplements to the cows come home. That is not what you need. You need these supplements. Why? Because they're in the right concentration. They're in the right relationship with one another. And you got more than, you know, they want to care. You want to take out beta carotene, you want to take this out, vitamin D, vitamin D. All that stuff is already in the right relationships, already in the food. Not just this, but I'm saying all the greens. Don't forget the green leafy vegetables, just because you don't see them here. They're, they're not that they're omitted because, and all, as I look at now, uh, worldwide incidents of prostate cancer, all the countries that are predominantly vegetarian, prostate cancer incidence is one one hundredth of what it is. Mm. Breast cancer, the same thing. So if you want to do something and take control of your health, this is how you take control. And you know what? You need to eat some of this raw. Mm -hmm. yeah. You need to eat some of it. You just need to slice it up. I mean, I used to grow up. Didn't any of you grow up eating tomatoes and mm -hmm. carrots and celery? Mm -hmm. You know? Right out of yeah, just, right, just, just ate it. Some of it right out of the garden. Sometimes we're still dirt on it. That dirt was good because it got to be B12 and something other. <laughs> no, I'm serious. The real
reason why the apples don't have to get shots is because they eat bugs and worms and poop and everything else. Yeah, they eat all of that stuff. It's all natural. So this, the only thing about this is that I, you don't make any money selling this. You don't make any money. And what we want to do now, actually this year, last year, Ray and Susan will remember, but I, we did a food summit, the 29th and 30th of September. Which, and you were there too. We're going to do another food summit the 29th and 30th of September. It will be at Loyola University, same place. But this year, the focus is going to be on hunger. In hunger. In Cook County, we just did a report. There are 760,000 people in Cook County every 90 days that don't know where their next meal is coming from. Good or bad. And I think that's a travesty. When we throw away one more more meals at lunchtime, then all those people get eaten. So that's what the meeting is going to be about. We're going to focus, continue to focus on that. Next year, God willing, we'll have another meeting when we talk about homelessness. Because if you know, you can't beat up people for if they don't have any food, they're going to eat what they get. And you don't blame, and I don't blame them for that. But what we want to do is there are a lot of people now at the ad hoc farm system. We're going to look at how we can leverage some of the land and the land bank for Cook County, how we could create, I'd like to see urban farms. Not just gardens, not just a few little, no, but farms. So actually this week we're looking at a 29 acre site that we're going to look to getting from Cook County now. But we got to figure out how we're going to pay, I mean, how we're going to pay, we can get the land, that's no problem. How it needs to be remediated, because a lot of that stuff, has a lot of bad stuff in it. We're probably going to start with a good part of it in raised beds because we just don't even want to bother raise the, the, the soil. It's just too bad. We get the water, and we got to figure out the partnership between government, private industry, and philanthropy to help do the things that our government is not doing. And given what I see happening now with the relaxation of EPA standards, if there's going to be an EPA anymore, and some of the other things, we got to take this in our own, own hand because if we don't, and we can grow this. I mean, do you know that the, the, uh, the state of Illinois is some of the most fertile farmland in the United States? State of Illinois. So I just say that the cause of the cause of vascular all other diseases causes it everywhere. So I just want everybody to walk out of this room with just a couple of thoughts. Number one, you don't have separate diseases. You got one disease. 99% of it caused by what you eat and drink. And if you change what you eat and drink, you can change a lot of it. When you go to True North, up by uh, in Santa Rosa, California, Dr. Goldberg, <coughs> they teach you, you go up there because a lot of people go up there for their different problems. The first thing they do is put you on a water fast. Mm. You don't get anything to eat or drink but water. Why? Because they reset your whole system. <laughs> It could be for up to 24 days, depending on what the condition is. So if you can look at Dr. Dr. Goldhammer, look up True North, True North, T-R-U-E, North, N-O-R-T-H, and that's what they do. And they do that to, because first of all, most of us can't taste food anymore. Because we've had such adulterated food with all these hy hyper it's full of little a lot of salt, sugar, and that sort of thing. That you can't taste the flavors of this, a lot of this stuff anymore. Each of these things impart their own flavor and their own heat and their own all those things. But we can't do it because we've been eating so adult. So I'm gonna stop right here, take your questions. Thank you for being so patient. Thank you so much for coming out. Make sure you stop by and see the museum. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to Pastor Moss for those Trinitarians in the room and see if we can have this museum in the, in the uh, atrium and have it because now that we just finished and also the classes where we're trying to figure out when they can start they still have to put some doors up and some other stuff so as soon as those things are done we will restart the class of Trinity I am going to probably do one more I'm going to show the movie or you should if you don't have it download it and watch it yourself how many of you saw Cowspiracy? okay so the same people that made Cowspiracy made another movie called What the Health.
Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Health. H e a l t h. And the other one's called cowspiracy. The other one's called cowspiracy. But the other one's called What the Health. And it's it's a $9.99 download on Vimeo. But I'm going to probably I'm gonna see if I can show it at one of the uh, meetings. If, even if we have to go back to Soul Veg and do it, we'll do it there. I'd rather do it at Trinity because we get more people at Trinity. So I thank you. You guys have been a great audience. audience. Thank, thank you so you. much for coming out. Yes, sir, Ray. Uh, yes, Dr. Mace, you mm -hmm. mentioned on your program about the documentary mm -hmm. called Seed, that the, it's a documentary called Seed by uh, independent men on PBS. Oh, is that right? Seed, S-E-E-D? S-E-E-D. And it's free up until May the 1st. If you just go to PBS. Oh, and I it's, about, that out. it's about Seed, the... the uh, the value of being able to save and grow your own seeds. Yeah, I think it's important that we can take charge of this. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, earlier you had the pictures of, of the food. I was kind of wondering more about the foods that are eaten within the community, like the almond milks, the morning star veggie burgers, the um, soy milks. Um, how healthy are those things? Well, here's what, here's what, what I've come to believe. We should eat whole food, plant-based diet. Whole food. That means just the way it comes out of the ground, just the way. All of these, those things are still in my mind. Morning Star, and while those might be good things for you, for your transition, but they're still processed foods. They're still processed. Just because they're vegan and processed, don't make it right. So, to me, it's good while you're trying to make that transition transition, because you can get fake strength, you can get fake this and fake that if you want it. But I, I just say, just go just stay to this, you know. Stay as close as close as you can. And there are lots, and I'm gonna tell you something, now compared to maybe four or five years ago, there are tons and tons of recipes out there. Uh, you can just go to allrecipes.com. You don't even have to go any place special anymore. But all of them, and then of course you've got the Forks Organized website, you've got, you've got uh, T. Colin Campbell's stuff, you've got Rip Esselstyn, you've got, you've got a bunch of people. I was actually with Dr. Esselstyn two or three weeks ago we were giving lectures in um, Racine, Wisconsin, of all places. And it was really, really, really uh, a great turnout. I was, I was rather surprised to see that 400 people would show up in the night to here and we had a great time. So I'm not a big I'm not a big fan. I'm not opposed to those products, but I just think they're great for you to make the journey. But get to the point where you can eat just you know these things. That's what we used to do. And people used to say it costs too much. It costs too much to eat right. That's the biggest lie ever told. Let me tell you, I'm one of ten kids. One of ten. And my mother would make a great big old pot of green. And we'd have some cornbread and some rice, and, and there'd be beans. It'd be, I know all the beans, lima beans, pinto beans, black eyed peas, all of the different beans. Those are still excellent things to eat. They're just missing from the repertoire of what a lot of us eat today. But you, it does not cost you a lot to eat, right? You can, it just, it just keep, it, it costs you more money to eat bad, because you pay for it. You pay more for it than, the, especially in the black community, you're paying more because it do it costs everything costs more in the black community. A gallon of milk, and and uh, we did the study looking at the differences between North Lawndale and Oregon, and it costs more to get milk in North Lawndale than it does in Oregon. It costs more to get certain things in some of the poor neighborhoods than it does in some of the other places, but still. A bag of beans, rice. It's just that we don't want to take any time to cook. You can't go get that instantly. You got to take the time to cook, okay? Because if you're not cooking for you, you certainly know who does for it, what they're doing, what they're cooking for. Did you have a question, young man? Or are you just stretching out? Okay, yes, sir. Hey, just got a question. Maybe I didn't hear like a um, question from, from this side correctly. And, 
Um, how about like vegan cheeses and vegan slices? Uh, would you el eliminate it from your diet? No, no, no. I didn't say I'd eliminate anything. I think those are great things. I think that we got to get to here. Okay. Okay. Now, whatever road you got to take to get there, take that road. And if you want this replacement thing, there are a lot of vegan. There's a lot of vegan cheeses. There are a lot of vegan other products, and I think those are good products. Mm -hmm. You know, but I think that they're good for a certain time. And you know, and I eat some of it too. Still, right now. But I tell you, my normal lunch now, now, nowadays, since I found another place out south, my normal lunch is a bowl of greens. I go get a bowl of kale greens from either Soul Veg or I go out to the place, uh, Daisy's Kitchen, when I'm at work. And then a bowl of uh, split pea soup. That's lunch. You know, so, and I don't, you know, and if I, and when I, once I figure out how to cook them greens like they cook them, I ain't buying them. <laughs> Because <laughs> I can cook myself. Yes, sir. Other question? No, just uh, what, what, what triggers the question is that, that I just I just I, I just went to to kind of some healing processes to to Amazon forest and the diet they are serving is completely what we see on this picture. There's yeah. no processed things, no kind of anything from store. They are just cooking and s breakfast, like lunch or, or, or dinner. Yeah. And that, that, that kind of raises my, my question. It would be kind of better to kind of get rid of those, those cheeses. No, you were saying this is where you need to no. be. Yeah, yeah, okay. This is where you need to be. So no meat? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, is, where do you see meat? I don't see any meat. Where do you see any meat? No chicken wings up there. Yes, ma'am, I'm coming this way now. I have two questions. Number one. Uh, one is what do you think about stevia? And the second one, do you think... Uh, a lot of black people are lactose intolerant. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's because what you were saying about milk that our bodies are rejecting that milk, uh, that dairy part, just naturally because we don't, you know, they just couldn't stand the, the, the dairy? Well, the thing is, we, I have lactose intolerance. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the lactose is the sugar in the milk. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that comes from cow milk, but I looked at all the other milks to see dog milk and everything else had lactose. I'm not really interested in whether it does or not. <laughs> but I would say that that's a, that's a telltale sign that you don't need that stuff. Okay. Again, that's number one. Your second question? St stevia. Well, let me tell you about artificial sweeteners. But, hmm? but, well, stevia is a plant, but I'm just telling you what they're doing with it. Okay, if you want the real stevia, you get a leaf. Yes. A stevia leaf. Okay. You get a stevia leaf. Okay. If it's not the leaf, it's a process thing. Okay. Okay? But let me just say this about all the other art, the Splendas and all the other stuff that we take. What happens is, is that the brain is looking for glucose. And when we don't, if, if we give it these sweeteners and it's not glucose, it's still looking for it. And actually there's data now that says when you use artificial sweeteners, you actually heighten your, your desire for sugar. So it makes it worse, not better. Did you have a question? I just had a comment. I asked you one time about the anti-processed cheese. And when I looked at that little, what we normally all of that stuff, did that. It's the easiest way to deal with it. And if you pick it up and you look on the, on the package and it has words that you don't know, you can't say what it is. <laughs> and just by the way, when you read the label, the first few things are what's mostly in that product. Okay? Yes, ma'am. I'll come curious, back to you. I'm curious if you're going downstate, are you also going to talk about how milk is, they're saying like Dr. Drucker's source where it's causing now, it's causing breast disease, like 27% of breast disease is from the milk, from the cow's bovine leukemia, <coughs> and how they've eradicated that in Europe, but we don't address that in the United States. See, to me, I don't like to take one disease at a Time. Okay. Michael Greger, by the way, she mentioned Michael Greger's site, great site, most of you probably know it all about already, called nutritionfacts.org. Great site to get information. Um, but I would say that why worry about it? I haven't had a glass of milk since I can remember. Okay? I, and, and I haven't. Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, whether I read the article or not, it made me so sick that I was telling me that something was wrong with that. Yeah. So I didn't eat it, I drink it. And you don't need it. That's the thing. You can get 
What what green leafy vegetables can you get vitamin D and calcium? Spinach, kale. Grains, the grains, what else? The grains. Yeah, the all that stuff is all. You don't need milk for that. Not only that, but you get it in the right relationship with other things when you get it out of the vegetables. That's the that's the beauty of it. Coming this way. Yes, ma'am. Then I'll come back around that way, like right, way. Okay. About frozen vegetables. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it really true when you get the frozen vegetables and you cook it, you're cooking out a lot of nutrients out of that? I'd rather take frozen vegetables out of fresh meat over fresh meat anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think if frozen works for you, then use frozen. Where you can get fresh, get fresh. Okay. And let me tell you, this is one of the things I learned when the first time I went to Europe. The first time I went to Europe, the apartments were small. Yeah. And the refrigerators were really small. Yeah. And I'm like, how did they do that? They had a little tiny refrigerator. Because they ate, they shopped every day. Yeah. Right. There were vegetable places that on the way home, wherever they, they stopped, almost like in some places in New York it used to be, where because a lot of Europeans were in Europe, in, in New York. You got your fresh stuff. And you and the same thing was true when I was in Italy, the same thing was true when I was in France, the same. Except the English are terrible. They, their food is awful. But <laughs> <laughs> when you go when you go to these places, you see that they eat fresh every day. Yeah. And actually, if you think, and so they don't need a refrigerator that's four feet wide <laughs> to store stuff for like eight months. <laughs> so what what I found, or what I, I try to do, and it's hard because we're so we got so much to do these days. Everybody's working, taking the kids to school, and I get all of that. So we do the best we can. But you know, one of the things that I try to do, it has been working lately because I've been busy running around, which I am going to slow this down. Uh, what does it good? What good does it do if I end up dead trying to help you? That makes sense. So I got to take care of self first. But but the thing I want the thing I like to do is when I can, and I can make a lot, just freeze it. Yeah. But separate it first. Put it in the little bags that are the sizes of the things that you want to eat. And you can, like on a, on a Sunday or days you get some time, just do that. And I mean, I still, I'm from a family of 10 kids. I still cook like this. You know, all my, my mother had no things about boys and girls' chores. Everybody learned how to cook. Everybody know how to clean. Everybody know how to sew. So everybody know everything. Because our oh, attitude was, you weren't going to get married and come back here thinking you're going to eat. That's right. <laughs> you learn how to cook yourself. If that fast tail girl can't cook, then you better get somebody else. <laughs> so anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that there's an opportunity for us to cook stuff. Make time. There's never any time. Make the time on a Sunday to cook and get you, and you know, I'm not a big fan of a lot of these things, but... If you have to put it in Ziploc bags or whatever, put it in there and freeze it. Take it. That's all you're going to do when you buy this other stuff. I mean, uh, Nelson Campbell has his foods now that are frozen. You can get it delivered. But if you're going to buy somebody else's frozen, why don't you just freeze your own? Unless you just don't have the time. And if you don't have the time, then you can do that. I just, uh, Plant Pure Nation, you can order those foods. I just got a shipment yesterday of uh, it comes, it comes 10 frozen in a pack. I'm going to take some pictures and put it in a slide. But it's actually pretty good. And it's it, it's good when you don't have time. You want to throw something in the microwave that you can eat that's a whole, that's nutritious. You know, it's got brown rice and vegetables and, and it's seasoned. You know, a lot of good food is like cardboard. Right. Mm -hmm. But I want it to see. I'm coming. That was your degree. Okay. I actually have three questions. First one is, oh my God. I'm, I'm sorry, first one is, what's your opinion of organic corn on the cob? Well, first of all, let me talk about organic. Okay. Um, and corn is a different issue. Exactly, because it's man-made, and most of it is actually GMO, even when it's labeled organic. Yeah, well, most of what we eat today, whether you know it or not, is GMO. Right. Yeah. Whether even it says it or not, it yeah. probably is. <laughs> so, the GMO is going to be hard to get away from. The organic part, uh, unless... How many of you were in the class I did on organic? Unless it has the black and the black symbol, mm -hmm. the certified organic, mm -hmm. it isn't. And it's even if, it's in a, right? if it's in a bin and they just got the word organic across there, that doesn't mean anything. Right. It means absolutely nothing. If you don't see the symbol, 
that says certified organic? It is not. And a lot of these stores are different from the USDA symbol. If you don't see that, it's not organic. And, and a lot of stores and a lot of communities just put up a sign that just says organic. And it's not. So in terms of corn, you know, corn is something that we have made. A, it's a commodity crop. And it's used for doing all kinds of wrong things. For example, it's used for feeding all the livestock, mm -hmm. all our commodity crops. Mm -hmm. Pigs, chickens, cows, mm -hmm. even fish. Mm -hmm. When you get farm-raised tilapia, they eat corn. When you're getting farm raised, some of the farm-raised uh, salmon, people talk about salmon all the time. And I'm like, well, you know, farm-raised salmon is a real issue because the natural color of the salmon is pink. Mm -hmm. And it's pink because it eats a little animal called krill. And when you ride farm-raised salmon, there is no krill. So in order to make the meat pink, because otherwise it would be gray, they use a DuPont dye that they pour in the pond so that the fish eat the dye to make the meat pink. So when you see, but it's supposed to have, supposed to have, if it says on your salmon, for those of you eating salmon, color added, that's what it means. That's what that means. I'm not a big fan of, of corn. Right, I am not either. I'm not a big fan of corn. But this one likes corn on the cup. So every once in a while, I'm going to But I'm just saying, but I'd rather eat seeing me corn than the fried chicken wing. Oh, yeah. we're vegan. Oh, okay. So yeah. I get that. Yes, sir. Oh, you had to I have two more questions. Yeah. Second one is the pediatrician. What is your uh, opinion on handling that? Because we've gone through a round of pediatricians when, when we tell them we're vegan. But they need cow's milk. No, they do not. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, there's a. Actually, one of the members of our church, who's one of my classmates, who is a pediatrician, is now looking to learn and learn to, be, to, to understand more about. And I just like to call it whole food, plant based, yeah, as opposed to vegan. Right. Um, and so he, Dr. Loris Rayner, is a pediatrician. He's on the staff of Advocate Christ, but he's really interested in learning and is open and not rejected. What's his name? Loris L O R I S R A Y N E R. And the last question? Oh, the third question is, um, just in general, how are we educating the medical staff into accepting We're not. vegan? We're not. Let me just tell you. Yeah. So, uh, one of the things that we try to do is admit with the deans of some of the medical schools. And the problem is they claim that the medical school curriculum is so packed with stuff. And paid by the dairy. And paid well, by well, let me just say, <laughs> I'll get to that part. But you've got to understand that the value, what is the major thing that drives the healthcare industry in America? Money. Money. No. Sickness. 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 The main driver for the healthcare industry is sickness. Without sickness, we don't have an industry. Okay? And and the sickness, I just told showed you that the number one, number two, three cause of death in America is us treating it. Right. It's what we do. It's physicians. So this is something we have to decide that you're going to do on your own. And you and you may and there are people that are out there. Now here's the other part. I just went to the American Institute for Cancer Research, and there are people out there who want to do this. They're dietitians and nutritionists yeah. and all kind and physicians that want to do this. But guess what? They don't get paid to do it. No. Yeah. They don't get paid to do it. And if there's no way to get paid for it, how can you support the salary for somebody to do it? And so right now, the things that the dietitians and nutritionists have to follow are the USDA guidelines. Yeah. And that's the fox exactly. ruling the hen house. Because I'm an RN, and, and I'm seen as that weird one. Oh, she vegan. That, she that weird one. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's why you be weird but live. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I want to preface my question by saying Dr. Mason is the man <laughs> when it comes to health and Yes. Talk to me about vegetarian pizza and Chinese food. What about Chinese food? Is it good? Is it healthier for us to eat you know, their shrimp, their fried rice, or uh, <laughs> as opposed to the egg for you Well, I'm going to tell you, I don't care whose diet it is. If there's, first of all, we know that the damage that, that is caused by a lot of the things that happen to our arteries are caused by the consumption of animal-based products, whether it's the direct meat or the eggs or the or the uh, milk, no, the, well, the worst was there's fat in milk, there's fat in cheese, all these, all these are animal derivatives, and it's the kind of fat that it is, because there's good fat in things like avocados, but don't eat too much of that, <laughs> um, and nuts. 
But the but the thing I would say is that I I don't. It doesn't matter who's the who's the, who's visiting it. Is. I went to Thailand. I bet the reason I was in Thailand, Indonesia, and some other places. And while I was there, I found it far easier to eat because you could get far more vegetable-based yeah. kinds of things to eat because that's what they eat. And even when there is meat, it's very little that they use. But if you walk in and want just, I mean, and when I say steamed or vegetables, you get exactly that, steamed vegetables. So I don't, whether, but if you're going to add shrimp to it, I mean, the thing is that gets me about, we eat the worst of the worst. <laughs> shrimp are bottom feeders. They're, they're scavengers. Catfish are garbage feeders. They're scavengers. Why would you even want to eat that stuff? It's good. <laughs> 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 what did I say earlier? All of what I'm talking about starts here. Yes. This is what has to change first. You have to, because see, I, I don't have the money. Venom doesn't have the money. We don't have the money to begin to just flood the airwaves with commercials. We would love to. And we don't have it. And it's not there. And it's like David against Goliath. And so everything that you eat, I mean, you're not going to sit down and you're not going to watch uh, 30 minutes of television or listen to 30 minutes of radio without having most of these commercials because that's who's sponsoring us. And until we get to the point where there's enough, there's a tipping point where people are buying the right stuff. The people who make this, and there's good, there's good cereals out there, there's a lot of good stuff that's out there. But until we start buying it in the quantities that we need to buy it, they won't have the money to do that either. And then what we have to do is we need to develop our alternative channels so that we can, we, and we can do that now. We can have our own channels, our own YouTube channels, our own, where we can do that. And if it, and if this, the taste, this is what Soul Vegetarian is great at. Soul Veg was great at creating what we call a transition diet. Okay, it's not all the way, it's transition. So every, and I went to Israel, I spent some time there, I, I, I went out to the, the kibbutz and the, the Bona and, and all that sort of stuff. And what they did was they created, they took the tastes and the textures that everybody was used to, and they made plant-based options. Yeah. Okay, so and but it, but the thing is, they're still frying. They're still doing a lot. There's still a lot of oil. Still some salt. But and it's something they made substitutes for everything we used to eat. That's what it is. But if you really want, if you really want to make the the, the trend, the true transition, you go from as you walk in the place, you go from eating on the left side of the restaurant to the right side of the restaurant where they have more. Of the Wow. And that's a trip, and that's a journey. So, I, I, you know, for anybody, you know, just wow. stay where we are. For those of you catfish eating, fried chicken wing, consuming <laughs> folks, all I can do, all I want to say to you guys is do this. Just that. Just try and add a serving of greens, some beans. Just add something every day. Every day. That's the way you start. Yes, sir. 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 Things. I was 221, and now I'm 184. Okay. And I didn't do, that wasn't done with exercise. That was just done, for the most part, by changing the way. In fact, I got, in fact, I got some clothes taken up because, you know, I'm cheap, so I don't know that. So I got some clothes taken up. But some of them need to be taken up so much, I can't even have them taken up. You know, the pockets would be like right here. So, so one of the things I would say is that it took time to get wrong, and it's going to take time to get right. Take your time. And this idea, and especially for men, because I see this all the time, especially with the younger people, uh, young men have been given this crazy notion 
that you gotta have muscles just bulging out all over the yeah. place to look manly. Yeah. Yeah. Like Nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> That's an image that helps to support a industry that sells all those supplements. And most of those supplements, those body, the so-called mass builders, they're whey-based protein. There's nothing worse for you than whey-based protein. And I'm gonna tell you, I mean, I have been in the company of guys like in the old days, Lee Haney and what have you, Lady Ronnie Coleman, and a bunch of these guys that do all this stuff. You gotta understand that whole industry is nothing more than a way to sell supplements. That's what their job is. That's how they get paid, is selling those supplements. They send you out to these stores, they buy out, you buy all of this stuff to get and so they and then they make it look like that's the look you want. And that's because they're controlling our mind. And they're controlling what so-called a healthy man or robust or real manly man looks like. But I got a picture in one of my presentations is that all of the manliest places to eat are places that serve steaks, sausages. I mean in Texas especially, 90 you get a, you get your picture on the wall if you eat this 96 ounce steak at one set. 96 ounces at one set. And that, they've got another place called, I think I, I talked to you, so you what they call the Heart Attack Cafe. Yeah. In Vegas, where they, they name all of the stuff exactly what it is. The Heart Attack Burger. They got the quadruple bypass burger. They got their fries are pure, are fine, are made of pure lard or fat. Butterfat. The shakes are 100% butterfat. So I'm just saying that, yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there, but you got to be concerned about how, you, how you're going to live and who you're going to listen to. Anytime you got a place where if you weigh over 200 or 350 pounds, you eat free as much as you want in the heart attack grill. And they get ready to open up more of them. So, and the young people, and, and I mean, I said as a young man, I was, you get caught up into that too, about the look. You get caught up in that look because, you know, but you can be muscular. I don't think you can't be muscular and vegan. There's a, what's his oh, yeah. name? The bodybuilder, the director of the books. Oh, God, there's a, I think I know. Um, he wrote a book. But there's a movie coming out called Game Changers. And it should be out sometime this year. It's done by James Cameron. And it is a, a movie that is, it's called Game Changers because the whole purpose of the movie is to dispel the myth that to be a high performance athlete, you have to eat meat. So they interviewed all of the top performing athletes around the world that don't eat meat and show what they can do. So I would look at Game Changers. And, and in the meantime, you could look up Rick Roll. Rich Roll, he is a, this is a guy who is a, Ultraman, he does the Ultraman. Yeah. That is one of the most rigorous things. It's like he started out, he did three Iron Mans back to back. So our young people and our my older people need to understand why you're in the gym trying to lift up the world, lift up the gym and everything else. That's not what you need to do to be healthy. Because the key you want to be healthy, you want to be lean and you want to be healthy. And the best way to do that is to eat what God gave us to eat. Alan Payne was one of those. And actually, the, there was a, the, the, the bodybuilding <coughs> champion of the Olympiad this year, he was a vegan. Yeah. He was a vegan. The body, the, the, the weight the power lift, the power lift oh. was a vegan. Yes, ma'am. I, I, just, I just wanted to make a comment that uh, uh, I found at work that people thought I was a freak because I didn't eat meat. Yes. You know, and so I'm retired now. But before I retired, I like to be around other human beings, right? Mm -hmm. The ones that don't think I'm a freak. Mm -hmm. So there, there are things called meetups where you meet with other people who are interested in a vegetarian life. Whether, whether you are or not, you can be a friend of a vegetarian. And you can learn more things about vegetarianism and also go to discounted meals at different restaurants. The, the uh, brochure that we have here has listed the vegetarian restaurants in the area. And there are four actually on the south side. And then there are a couple in, in the suburbs, the south suburbs. But um, 
a good a, a good way. It doesn't cost anything to join the the meetups. And Vadim is is uh, uh, with the uh, Chicago Veg meetup. But there are other vegetarian meetups besides that one. But the Chicago Veg uh, combines education and eating. So you you learn two things. You know, and it's not a real push. You you do what you want to do. So. Any more questions? That's it. Now, let me just say this: that if you have a medical condition that you're being treated for, you continue seeing your doctor for that. If you're going to make a change in your diet, you make that change, but you continue seeing your doctor for that. And until you see that those numbers, in God we trust, all others must have data. So the numbers <laughs> begin. Well, and as you see your numbers change and improve. Then you talk about quick weaning yourself off of all these things. Because things like high blood pressure, you can't tell what's happening with how you feel. Because it doesn't give you none of those things. So I always make a caveat that you always follow these things with your doctor. You've got to have, in God we trust, all others must have data. So if you don't believe that your diabetes is getting better, don't believe that your high blood pressure is going lower. Measure, get the facts, and you can because if you're not careful, you can eat a lot of vegan things that have salt, like too much salt in it. It has, I mean, there's a lot. Of, you can eat bad vegan too. Yeah. So I just want you to know that. So if you have those conditions, really take time, get the information, follow. Um, and I'm not opposed to physicians at all. I'm a physician myself, although I don't see patients anymore. But you know, I did surgery for a long time. But I'm just wanting you to know that always get the information. Always get the and if you what you should do before you start this journey, go to your doctor if you haven't had it already. Get you a full battery. Get your whole your whole chemistry profile. Get all these inflammatory. There's a whole panel called inflammatory markers that you can get. And then you change change what you're doing and then do that for about three months and go back and get it again. So that you can see it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anybody's word for it. Do it yourself. Because what's going to work for you is going to work for you. And it's not going to work for you the same way it worked for him in the same time frame. Okay? Three last questions? Yes, three. Okay, one, two, three. That's it. Yeah. Uh, really Only one question. Yep. <laughs> quite, quite recently, and, and I didn't even have to spend a time. And well, she had her hand up. I didn't see it. Okay, four. I, I didn't have time to kind of investigate it, and, uh, but uh, it's, it's getting very trendy recently uh, to go gluten-free. And I'm just wondering how important, in fact, it is to be aware how gluten-free you, your, your diet is. Well, I mean, it, especially if you have a gluten intolerance, which many people do, and they don't even know they do. So gluten, is, gluten only comes from three things, wheat, barley, and oats. It's the only place you, uh, you get... It's, from the, it's a, the life germ, so to speak, of, the, of that. The gluten is part of what makes the plant. Uh, it's, it's, it's a constituent, I should say, of the plant. So I think that if you have a gluten intolerance, if you want to just eat gluten-free, that's fine. But if you're going to eat gluten-free and have a T-bone steak, I don't get it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't get that. So don't pick one thing. That's all I'm saying. Don't pick one thing. Make a decision that you're going to go on a journey, okay? On a journey to, to help more healthy living. And of course, if you, most of the times the things that you're going to have is gluten are going to be your breads and things of that nature. So I would, I'm not as worried about that unless you do have a gluten intolerance. And most of you have a real bad gluten intolerance will know it uh, because you have diarrhea and abdominal pain and all kinds of other stuff that happens. So, to me, start out with just if you don't, if you eat, if you catfish eating steak, you know, chicken vegan, prime, all that kind of stuff. Start out just ch making a small change and keep that change persistently for like two to three weeks. Then make another change. Then make another change because if you try to do it all at once, I can almost guarantee you, many some people will be okay, others will fail. So actually, that gluten-free thing, it's not important well, it aspect important for, for some people. For, for, just for some people who, who are n intolerant. But I would say if you can eat gluten-free, do it. Oh, okay. Okay. 
There was another question over here. Yes, ma'am. I'm really struggling with um, trying to make my diet interesting. And I met you a while back. Mm -hmm. I heard you on WVON. Um, you really give me excitement because you were telling people how you lost weight and how you changed your diet. You had talked about the stint in your heart. So when I heard about that, I immediately changed my diet and had lost like like 20 pounds. I was up to like 220. And I was trying to eat healthy, eat the chicken. And for some reason, I couldn't eat, lose the weight. But as soon as I went vegan, the weight just went off. Yeah. But um, another thing, I eat a lot of tofu. Mm -hmm. And I hope that that's okay to eat that. Because I, like I said, my that's meals are real boring. They're real boring, but I'm trying to pump them up. I eat a lot of things vegetables and I eat a, I drink a lot of smoothies like in the morning before I leave out I'll make me a vegetable smoothie and then for lunch I'll probably eat like a lot of vegetables but it's just I want to learn how to really make my food interesting where I can introduce it to other people. Yeah I, and that's a great point and I don't like to see anybody overdosing on tofu. Right. Okay. You know, I really don't. I think that there are other ways and other things so what that means what that says to me is that you need to look at other, there's a lot of different sites you can look at now for how to do things and make them very, very interesting. Um, and, I, and, and, and I don't have, to, can't go through more more today, but they're really, really, really are. They're really, really, really are. And the thing is, I guess for me it was easier because I'm not growing up one of ten kids. I wasn't used to any variety. You know, we ate what there was to eat. Yeah. And it was usually about one or two or three or four things. And if you didn't eat that, you didn't eat it all. I mean, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Right? So, for me, I, you know, I can make a pot of, of greens or beans or whatever, or I can make uh, I can make the vegetarian chili, or I can make and and I don't need some. That's me though. Right, right. But for those who need that variety, uh, and and there's a lot of ways to make things interesting. There's a lot of ways, and I would look at. You know, everybody's got cookbooks now. Ann Creel has a new cookbook that she just wrote with her aunt, Esther, I'm sorry, has a new cookbook out that she just wrote with her daughter um, on uh, Plant Pure Nation. They have a new cookbook out too. So, and there's ways not only to, to, to make it taste good, but make it look good too. Yeah. You want to make it look good. I, have one more I, forgot, I forgot to mention to people, but I got a, uh, uh, I put together a list of all the vegan books in the oh. Chicago Public Library, oh, yeah, 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 and we pulled them, this is, from, this, this is just from what's this, from this library, and there's a whole bunch of children's books right there, right here on the right. That don't look boring, does it? No. <laughs> we can check those out. And Ray and his wife, they do a great job. I mean, he does usually cooking demonstrations every year, at the, and he's been to my house and cooking. So, I mean, he can, he can do it. I would just answer to her question in that if you visit the uh, Spice House, she's not listening. Yeah, answer to your question is one thing that I've learned, and I've been on a plant based diet since 47 years now. Wow. I'll be 70 this next month. And you look one, of the key, one of the key things is learn some some basic spices. Get your yeah. organic spices, start growing your own herbs. Mm -hmm. And then flavor is, is the key, is how they hook us. Mm -hmm. So if you can just start flavoring your food with some basic spices, get a blend, but watch out for the salt. If it's right. non GMO and organic, you can get that at the uh, Whole Foods, yeah. Trader Joe's, the Spice House. Mm -hmm. Then look at, say if I want Italian, I want uh, Southern, Whatever, look at the spices that my mother used, my grandmother used, and then I'll take those and get it in its purest form. And I'll add the flavor to the drink or to the beans. It's easy. And it's good too, because I've eaten some of some uh, uh that, that you, you cook. And it's, I just want to let you know, Ray, it's, it's really good for the young people in the audience. And you're probably, how do you say 18? Yeah, you're old enough to get that. There's a, there's a cookbook out that's written, well, maybe not specifically, but I saw it and I cracked up when I saw it. It's called Thug Kitchen. Thug <laughs> Kitchen. Thug Kitchen. And I, but it's all vegan. It's a totally vegan book, though. It's all vegan. What's his name? I think I know it. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. And it's got the worst language in the world in it. 
<laughs> the worst possible language in the world. But it speaks to a demographic that needs to understand that if they're going to be here and thrive, because the thing is, this will kill you. Yeah. You know, because many of you, I see a lot of these young guys now, they, at 30, they broke down. Yes. Yeah. They broke down. Amen. So let me just say this, guys. Thank you so much Thank you. for being here today. I really appreciate you coming out. I really, really do. Thank you so very much. I think most of you, if you ever want to, if you want to keep up with when the next meetings are, just go to restartforlife.org, and you can register at Restart for Life. And then that way you'll get all of the information about when the next when I'm going to restart up the, uh, the meeting. But I think the next one will be probably at Soul Veg. We haven't picked up, I mean at the church, we haven't picked out a time yet. And then I'm going to make sure that we can see if we can get this exhibit at Trinity so people can come through. Because we have about 5,000 people yeah. Yeah. I mean on Sunday alone yeah. that come through. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Thank you, brother. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.